Uh, hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Rice. And uh, today we have a panel on eliminating construction waste. Uh, I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Rice. And today we have Robert Crocker, who is the Deputy Director of China Australia Center for Sustainable Urban Development. He is moderating our panel. This is the third panel that Robert is moderating for us. And uh, we're pretty excited. I am pretty excited about his panels because it's always about diverse topics and uh, he approaches it significantly differently. If you haven't seen the other two panels he's moderated, please go to our website, go to the menu item content, go to video panels and you will find them there. Uh, Robert is going to talk to Duncan Baker Brown, who's a senior lecturer at the University of Brighton. He is also the director of BBN Sustainable Design. Uh, if you have, please feel free to put in your questions either through the Q and A or on chat, because uh, during the course of the panel, uh, Robert or Duncan will be taking your questions and will be responding to it live. So over to you, Robert. Oh, thanks, Veta. Uh, Hello, Duncan. Um, <laughs> I, I think probably we should start by asking you to uh, tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you um, got into this very interesting architectural practice where you deconstruct buildings. Um, you know, so to me, this is a, a fascinating um, story. Now, what, what led you into this? Because it's not very common at the moment. Well, um, I come from uh, quite a long sort of background and thought process into this because in the mid 80s, um, when I was doing my degree in architecture, I was actually studying part time. And um, in about 1988, I was thinking about not carrying on my studies and becoming uh, work, working for Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. Uh, and that was because I was actually working on um, the kitchen design for, it was the second kitchen in this house in London, and the kitchen was worth £100,000 in 1988, and it was the second kitchen in the house. And um, I was just thinking, what are we doing? And the amount of, it was a beautiful kitchen, a beautiful thing, but the amount of resources that went into the manufacture and construction of that kitchen made me think, this is silly. So, um, and when I was about eight years old, I, I lived in a, just northwest of, London um, in an area called Epping Forest and Epping Forest is incredible because it's because it exists it starts in the east end of London in Walthamstow and it's been protected <clears throat> since Henry II's reign in the 13th century and the fact that it exists is extraordinary and still does and um, I was walking with my mother in a field uh, when I was eight years old and I, I, I got to the top of the field and I just thought we were in the middle of you know the countryside and then I said, Mum, what's that? And uh, looking in the horizon, and, it, and it, she said, that's the city of London. And I was immediately made aware of how fragile the natural world was and how um, precious it was. And, you know, she said to me that, um, uh, you know, in, in her mind, the, um, the natural world would, that would exist in the future would only be like what we call the, um, the green belt that surrounds London, which we were living in, and uh, the national parks. And so, so fast forward, I've since the 90s been focused on sustainable uh, development, sustainable design. And um, in about 2008, I worked on um, a zero waste project, which was uh, a challenge, a TV challenge, actually, to, uh, to design and build a house in only uh, six days. It was the construction time was six days. And that house had to be made out of um, organic carbon locking material. And it was zero waste on site. So we were then going to rebuild that, that project um, because it was a TV program. It went out six nights in a row. It was called The House That Kevin Built. It was the sort of the live version of Grand Designs that I know they have in Australia and the UK and other places. And um, I wanted to rebuild it at the University of Brighton where I work. And during its sort of rebuild, uh, it transformed from The House That Kevin Built, which is all about organic carbon locking material into um, into waste and uh, for 15 years I'd been developing buildings, school buildings, houses, offices, uh, quite lots of different sectors using locally sourced organic materials so rammed earth walls, uh, you know willow trees, uh, sheep's wool insulation, all this sort of stuff but I felt that meanwhile behind me there's this big sort of pile of waste <laughs> was gathering of 
the nasty stuff. And in 2012, there was a statistic that for every five houses built in the UK, one house worth of surplus material and waste and demolition waste went to landfill. So 20% of the stuff arriving on a construction site was ending up in landfill. That's got a bit better now. We're up, we're up to about six or seven houses before we have one house worth of waste. But it's a big problem. And um, so that was my way in, really, via the sort of environmental angle. I was always, uh, I, you know, I watched the M11, 11, M11 motorway and the M25 motorways plow through countryside that my family were brought up in. So I've always been aware from a sort of an environmental angle, really. Thank you. That was a very interesting um, introduction. I, I, what I'd like to do is wave in front of the audience. Who <laughs> Thank you, I think it's, um, I think it's a, a fantastic uh, project. Can you tell us a bit about this project and, uh, you know, where it came from and, um, yeah. you know, your, a, a bit about your involvement with it? Yeah. Well, as I was saying, the, uh, that what was called the house that Kevin built in 2008 morphed into what's now called the Brighton Waste House. And uh, uh, this was um, the U Europe's, if not beyond Europe's, first um, permanent two-story building made out of 90% of discard uh, discarded materials, people, uh, materials that people threw away. And uh, we've got this sort of passive house standard. It's not a dwelling, it's a, a sort of teaching facility. And we worked on that for three or four years. And the experience of building a high performing, you know, this, this is a building that creates 30% more energy than it consumes. So creating a high performing building built by students, 360 students we had, um, that experience got me thinking uh, and much more aware of other projects around Europe and around the world um, that we're, we're dealing with issues of resource management at the end of the day and the reduction in consumption of brand new raw materials. Um, I got to know Professor Michael Browngart um, and Professor Walter Stahl, and these are the two, two guys in the sort of uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, who really started developing the idea of cradle to cradle and the idea of a circular economy. Walter Stahl was the first person who actually published the, um, a paper that used the term um, a circular economy. And um, so in 2002, uh, My, Michael Browngart and Bill McDonough wrote Cradle to Cradle. And I heard Michael Browngart speak quite often. And he would say that recycling and reuse of secondhand material is actually a waste of time. You're only de delaying the inevitable, which is its you know, route to landfill incineration, or more likely in the case of plastic, our oceans. Uh, and so I thought, well, I don't wholly agree with that. Um, and so I've written a book that um, deals with a sort of route towards proper closed loop systems in the circular economy. And uh, it does that via four main chapters um, that have real case studies, case studies of delivered projects in the world of product design, fashion, architecture, urban design. And the idea is that these are steps and each step is nearer to a closed loop system. And the first um, basic step is recycling. And so I look at uh, case studies and there I've, um, in each of the main chapters, I've got an inter uh, quite a long interview with uh, someone who's an expert in the field. So I, I found the work of Parley for the Oceans quite interesting because they were engaging with Adidas and Coca-Cola and, and uh, all, the, all the big multinationals. Um, and th their idea was quite simply, if you made a pair of training shoes out of ocean plastic waste or illegal, illegal gill nets, and your consumer knew that, they, would that affect their behavior change? Um, uh, the next step in the book is, is um, reuse. So that's an improvement on recycling for a number of reasons. As designers, for example, and uh, end, unit, end users, if you are working with secondhand material, it, it comes with a sort of provenance, a story, a narrative. People love secondhand bricks in the UK, love secondhand fireplace surrounds, whatever it is, something that's got a heritage. Recycling sort of obliterates that because you reprocess a material and it's you it, in some cases it's like the virgin material So the idea of making people aware of the provenance of the material is a lot easier with secondhand material um, So there's a lot of examples in the book of people reusing material including you know someone who's built a community center in in King's Cross in central London that's made out of bits of uh, building from the 2012 Olympics so 
uh, you know, the real challenges of that the contractual liabilities associated with using secondhand material is being addressed in some of these case studies. And then the third step is reduce. It's literally turning up to a situation. Some people are calling it refuse now, uh, some sort of post uh, declaring climate emergencies in different places. Um, and so it's this idea of turning up as a, at a situation as an architect or a designer and just saying, well, instead of doing the normal thing, which might have been to demolish that, whatever it is, a row of houses or offices or uh, whatever, uh, you say, no, I'll work with what's there. And so, in effect, the ecological footprint, the amount of stuff, whether it's energy, carbon, water, food, whatever, that goes into improving that situation or giving the client whatever they feel like they're needing, housing or whatever, has used a lot less material than before. And, and with that, you might use a technique that we call resource mapping, which is literally using locally sourced resources and that might be materials lying around that might be uh, you know materials that are a sort of um, a waste product from a, a factory process or whatever or it might be stuff that's grown you know there might be work woodland working woodland thing or whatever and then the third the fourth part of the book is dedicated to sort of authentic closed loop systems so these are uh, buildings that are designed as material stores for the future so the source material is either second hand or organic um, and it's this is where buildings are sort of put together in a way that uh, they are easy to dismantle and um but the book is sort of book book ended as it were at the beginning and the end with um with uh, some essays reflecting on uh well at the end it's uh, you know where, where we think we can uh, go with all of this but the beginning of the book deals with things like the, the sort of legal challenges that we've got in legislation um you know, when you're talking about concepts such as uh, leasing materials, leasing a facade of a building or leasing light, you know, Philips very famously lease Lux now instead of selling light fittings. You know, who owns what? And uh, what are, if you're a building owner and you're leasing the, the building at the moment, you're in the UK and Europe, you're not allowed to lease a facade, for example. You have to own it properly, otherwise you're not the owner of the building. So the, the I think to sum up the book, it's just got a lot of interesting case studies. And I think it's a, an optimistic book because it's trying to show people that stuff is actually happening and and around the world there's a lot of bad news all the time and from my point of view I do see people in the world of construction and all the industries that involve design and making the things whether it's phones cars or or buildings you know we're resource managers we're deciding what things are made of or we have an influence on what they're made of and if we're really interested we can understand the process that goes into the manufacturing of the components that make the building or the car or the phone that we've designed. And I think we've, as designers, we've got to be much more engaged with that and think about where the materials come to make our thing and also where our thing ends up. So we've got to design out. Is this a truth uh, window you're proposing? Is it, is it a what? A truth window. Do you yes. remember? Yes. yes. <laughs> and, but a truth window onto materials uh you know so if a building is a collection of materials um you know you're in a sense you're referring to the idea of the material passport um uh, and uh the the idea I, I know some designers use qr codes to 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 enable people to identify what's in a product as a say a shirt or a um, you know, and so I was, I was wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit about waste itself and the problem of value in waste, and then we could perhaps get back onto the idea of, um, you know, the the building as a as a bank of materials. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, yeah. Obviously, the so there's a lot of um, especially uh, in the UK. I'm looking at my own experience at the moment. We've got a 70% of our population uh, live in areas that are where the local authorities declared a climate emergency. And so those people are also saying we, we want to be net carbon zero by 2030, which is slightly over ambitious and you might say ridiculous, but ambition ambitions not to be knocked, I think. So um, the issue there is that um, uh, the reappropriation of waste is in a way it's, um, it's an easy win. If we can sort out our waste procurement and have the appropriate legislation to 
allow us to get hold of the waste before the um, waste managers do, then it's actually not designated as waste. And so if you eliminate that word and that concept in a way for a bit, you're actually just moving stuff around. And at the moment, large contractors, building contractors in the UK, um, do just that amongst themselves. You know, within a large contractor, they will m move resources from one building site to another. And they'll do that for many reasons. But one of the main reasons is that, um, I mean, they still will do this, which is to, if they've got surplus material, they'll, they'll throw it away and they'll send it to incineration or landfill. And, but the cost of that is getting ever more prohibitive. So it's actually worth investing um, in their own infrastructure to swap materials. And it was interesting, yes, last week, there was a white paper produced talking about this idea of a, um, a platform for a, a resource exchange ac across um, all contractors. So it'll probably work regionally, but the idea would be that contractors would swap waste and surplus material amongst themselves um, to use a source material for their buildings. Now, what that does crucially is eliminate um, the waste procurement people because the problem we had or the issue we had when we worked on the waste house when we were building that out of waste construction material is that we didn't build it out of waste material. We, we got to the material before the waste procure, the waste managers did. Once they've got the dev designated it as waste, there's all sorts of problems. And one of the problems is actually is it gets often gets mixed. So then you don't know if you've got exactly what you want and it might be, uh, you know, there might be asbestos mixed in with it or, or whatever. So um, our strategy was to get hold of the material before the, um, it was designated as waste. Um, I think what will happen in the future is that you'll have the um, sort of material exchange, um, the resource exchange amongst big contractors and that will trickle down to smaller contractors. There are already organizations around Europe, especially in the Netherlands. There's a, you know, there's an organization called the Excess Materials Exchange at the moment where, where they've got a, a platform and a network where you can uh, swap materials. And there's um, Rota in, Bro in Brussels are doing the same and Superuse in the Netherlands are doing the same. So there are these platforms. Um, there's also a rejuvenated Salvo in the UK, you know, which has been going since the 1990s. So, um, I think there are emerging platforms, but we are at a strange time. I know the world of um, secondhand building material exchange at the moment um, is getting smaller, to be honest. However, the ideas are coming through now. And the, uh, you know, the, so basically there's an audience and therefore, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's people who are receptive to the idea of um, reusing secondhand materials. So I'm hoping the old uh, building yards all around the UK and Europe uh, aren't going to close down before we we have the legislation to support it because like I said it was quite significant last week this this white paper uh, proposing a, a national uh, resource exchange so so for me um, you know when we were doing the waste house the strap line we had there is there's no such thing as waste there's just stuff in the wrong place and I think that's in a way the mentality you have to have but there you know, there are, there, there's, there's big issues around uh, insurance liability. How can you guarantee that um, a secondhand bit of material, how do you know what its performance is? That is the big deal. And uh, there are ways of getting over that. I was going to ask you about that and the other barriers to enabling uh, this free exchange of uh, information, particularly. Um, so, you know, accurate information about, say, uh, a steel beam or, yeah. um, you know, uh, some a concrete slab or something that can be moved, you know. Um, but I, I just wanted to get your feeling for where you would like to see change first happen. You know, which, what is to you the most important change to turn this around? Because as you say, we're doing a lot of talking and we're doing a lot of wishing yeah. But uh, often, um, you know, on the ground, uh, you've got uh, ways of doing things that are, in effect, stopping uh, this change from happening. Uh, for example, legislation that requires brand new materials, you know, in certain situations. Yeah, so. yeah well, the big thing uh, in, in the UK and across Europe, and it's, I know it's the same in many places across the world, is what we call value-added tax, VAT. Um, and there's a, uh, at the moment, 
basically if you work on an existing building you have to pay VAT on all materials and labor associated with those works. Um, so in effect, it costs 20% more to work on existing buildings than it does on new buildings. And we get into this ridiculous situation in the UK where buildings have to be demolished to save money. And so you're demolishing a building one week, throwing it away, and then the next week you're building new walls exactly where they were before, but the, if it's new build, you don't have any VAT. So it's a 20% difference. It's, they're zero rated. And so there's a campaign in the UK at the moment to uh, get that changed. Um, so at the moment, we're in effect, we're encouraged to demolish, which is madness. And that's where a lot of our waste is coming from. You know, we, it's what we need to be able to do um, in, in parts of the, of, the, of the planet where we've got established built environments of significant size. We need to be able to just tweak and adapt these places to accommodate either more people or, or you know, to reduce the carbon footprint of, of the city. Um, and um, at the moment, we're prohibited from doing that because it's it's the most expensive uh, option. So it's a, at the moment, it's, you, know, you see in the city of London and other financial districts around the world, buildings is going up and down all the time on the same site. Whereas, um, I, you know, we're working with um, Rota uh, consultants in uh, Brussels, and at the moment, they're deconstructing instead of demolishing tall buildings in their World Trade Center in Brussels, and. Uh, They've, they've managed to convince the client and the city to slow down the demolition process. So it's deconstruction. And these are buildings that are only 20, 25 years old, and they were built as financial propositions. The financial plan was a 25-year plan. At the end of their life, they're, they're worthless. They were never lo loved. They were always, always just a sort of financial proposition. So they're always going to come down after 20 or 25 years. Um, Rotor have got in there and slowed down the demolition process to deconstruction. They're literally unbolting the facades and um, the frame and stripping out the interiors. And they've got a yard, big, a big yard and a big building, and they clean up the material and they sell it and it's sold already. So, you know, they're, they're a working example of, uh, of what can happen. And there are, there are other people doing that. And we're working on a research project at the moment, EU funded interreg project. And uh, it's across uh, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, France, England and Ireland, quite a large area. And we're putting together a, um, a directory of 1500 suppliers dealing with the building deconstruction and crucially the reuse of secondhand materials in new buildings. So that directory is going to be really interesting. And we're also putting together a, a document with 36 case studies. So the thing with this is legislation is key, but also seeing, seeing it done. And my book touched on that and this work we're doing with Rota, which will be published in two years' time, uh, will show that as well. I think people need to see examples of, uh, you know, the sort of um, tall glass and steel and concrete buildings that we see everywhere, those ubiquitous things, that uh, seeing how they can be deconstructed, how they can be a resource for future buildings. Um, because, you know, we know, you know, historically in the UK and, um, you know, buildings from the 19th century and earlier, they were always deconstructed and reused. Buildings were always a material store for future buildings. And uh, in the UK, again, buildings up until 1910, uh, brick buildings, Victorian buildings, they are material stores and they've, they've been adaptable and, and uh, reusable. But um, the, the big problem's really been concrete and cement in mortar, which has stuck bricks together. So the mortar joint's stronger than the bricks. So you end up with rubble instead of uh, bricks when you knock the things down. So, but for me, we we do need legislation, and um, we're in a really interesting situation in the UK, where, like I said, seventy percent of our population live in areas where the local authority, local government, has declared a climate emergency. But, and they've also declared they want to be net carbon neutral. And with the construction industry basically creating half the carbon emissions, consuming half the um, world's natural resources that are, are mined every year and creating in the UK two thirds of the construct, two thirds of the waste that we create, um, it's the construction industry that could really uh, step up and um, you know, help these local authorities achieve their net zero carbon targets. But we don't have the technical building regulations to support this at the moment. So the best way into that, yeah? Do you think um, uh, the regulations follow the economics? I mean, my, my sense is that 
the way has been made smooth for uh, pouring money into these new buildings, um, uh, selling them, making some profit, and then watching them slowly devalue. Um, it's almost as though the policy changes need to involve economic levers, do you think, uh, to change this? And the other question I was going to ask you was uh, the use of IT in this. Um, in theory, we should be able to create much greater transparency. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is something that I wanted your thoughts on, actually. So, <laughs> what was, Can you get back to the first question? I understand the second question. What was the first question well, again? The first question was around uh, what you'd been talking about, that legislation and regulation uh, tends to follow the economics, the, the status quo, uh, you know, it tends to justify um, smashing down buildings yeah, yeah. that are year old because that, you know, you mentioned that VAT. Uh, there's probably other incentives to do this yeah. within the banking yeah. world, yeah, um, yeah. you know, and also to devalue the waste, the building uh, as waste within 20 years, which is ridiculous when you think about it because it's still a functioning building. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I, well, I guess. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe well, I, I, I think <laughs> I, I think it's complex. I think that uh, I mean, uh, I've said out loud quite a lot lately that I think um, we in a way we've got to stop waiting for our uh, prime ministers and presidents and their governments to sort these things out. And what's happening, which is really interesting, is you've got regions and city states who are taking the lead. So literally the day after President Trump uh, says he's going to pull out the Paris Climate Accord, uh, you've got uh, California and New, New York State joining as an alliance uh, to do the opposite. So uh, California's the fifth, fifth biggest economy in the world now, it just overtook the UK. Um, and they can, to a certain extent, act independently of their president. And uh, I think this is what's happening. So for me, most of the pop greatest proportion of the population of the world now live in cities. And I think it's cities that work, can affect change and will do and have their own sort of local legislation. And you've got that in the UK with planning law. So you've got, you've got the national planning policy uh, framework, but then locally it's interpreted. And with the circular economy, for example, you've got some um, various cities um, in the process of Im um, imposing a circular economy route maps and uh, they'll impose that uh, aspiration with uh, planning policy local to, so they'll have you know whatever development site they're looking at it will have its own um, local plan we call it and in that will be embedded principles around the circular economy the challenge will be that builders will say or contractors and developers will say okay you want that but the building regulations say I don't have to do that. Uh, but we've been, we in the UK have been there before. And um, until 2016, we had something called Code for Sustainable Homes. And, and that, was purport, that was giving you a lot higher standards of construction and, and low carbon aspirations than building regulations asked for. And those, that, that document was uh, um, used by planning departments. So they would say, yes, you can build your 400 homes over there, but it's got to achieve virtually zero carbon uh, objectives and, and it happened it was unfortunately repealed in 2016 uh, because uh, the, uh, David Cameron our Prime Minister at the time said that the building regulations would do the job instead but they haven't um, and building regulations are in a, a bad state a, a bad place at the moment in the UK because we've had the, the Grenfell Tower disaster uh, the report's actually being published today the first bit of it and we've got uh, you know, the building regulations around fire there was had not been updated for over 10 years. And we've got that situation in other parts of the building regulation. So it's very interesting times here because local authorities are shaking it all up in the UK and demanding net zero carbon targets, which are really ambitious. Um, so it's just interesting times. And we don't, but at the moment, we don't have the legislation to support um, what I'm talking about. But what was interesting last week, like I say, is there's this uh, white paper presented to uh, Parliament, which was all about this idea of a major resource um, exchange, a national resource exchange, which would be a for me a game changer. Can you can you perhaps share that link? Because I've got a question from uh, one of our 
one of our audience who would like I to can, know. Yeah. I can literally look for it. Should I just do that? Because I'm on, is that what you mean? I, I can uh, be yeah, very quick. Yeah. I've, okay. I've already got it. <laughs> okay, so it, it's um, it's by by an organisation called MyROG, which is le literally M I hyphen R O G, and it's the it's it's the case for a resource exchange mechanism, white paper number three, two thousand and nineteen. Um, and I mean, I can uh, send it to whoever wants it. I've got a copy of it. So. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of uh, these things coming out. There's lots of circular economy papers coming out as well, uh, come mm. from London and other places. So yes, I can um, I can get it sent to whoever needs it. Good, good. Uh, the the other part of my question was concerning the use of IT. Um, yeah, and uh, you've been involved in that quite a bit. Um, how how do you think? IT can, in a way, help us push through some of these barriers? Well, if you allow me to focus on the construction industry, um, we already have taken on board something called BIM, which is building information modeling. So it's basically intelligent 3D models of the built environment that um, uh, when you're de designing a new building, um, uh, basically the whole design team, structural engineers, environment and environmental engineers, architects, and even the quantity surveyors uh, can input information into this model. And then basically the contractor can build from it, but it's a great way of all the information being in one place. And therefore it's a great tool that tells you what your building is when, you're, when, when it's handed over to the uh, end user and owner. And then in 30 years time or whenever, when the, the building wants to be deconstructed or say a hundred years time, you know what the building's made of. Now there's, there's a move around the world now for um, material passports. And these would work really well with BIM because it's just another layer of information. It's another bit of data. And material passports basically tell you what the material is or the component is. Um, and, but crucially, this is how I understand it, they'll also give you an idea of its provenance, where it's come from, and also its ability to be recycled or reused. Um, and it's, you know, there'll be its uh, toxicity if that's an issue and what have you. So you'll basically have a thorough understanding of the resources at your fingertips, the physical resources that constitute this building. And that, that's for me, it's, a, it's an easy um, sort of bit of data to add on to the, uh, BIM models, which we've already got. Um, the other issue is that um, I know of organizations, there's an amazing consultancy in the Netherlands called Metabolic, and they are literally uh, mapping the resource potential of cities to supply i.e. material for, for new developments in the city or, or nearby. So uh, they're actually quantifying the material that in this you know, in one case equals the greater metropolitan district of Amsterdam. So I've said this out loud a few times and people say, well, aren't you just encouraging demolition or deconstruction? And, and no, you're not. I mean, there are, re there are always reasons in cities why buildings um, need to be taken down. And, and all we're saying is, if that's the case, the buildings come to the end of its legitimate life, uh, instead of it being thrown away, you can turn up at a situation with your smartphone and literally do a quick survey of the building. And, you, and it will tell you, because of the QR codes attached to the materials, um, it will tell you what you've got as a resource. And so as an owner, you know what you've got as a, a resource to sell or to reuse. And as a buyer, uh, you're, you're harvesting the local environment for material to create your new environment, whatever it is. And that's all, that technology is there now. I've got a, I've got a couple of interesting questions from our yeah. audience, uh, Purva Tavri. Um, uh, she, um, the first one, um, uh, you know, is about, I think we've covered some of, some of what she's asking about. Um, but the second one um, is about whether reuse regu regulations uh, need to come for promoting centralized or decentralized reuse. And in a way, you sort of in a way you've touched on this when you've emphasized to me in other conversations uh, the importance of uh, a kind of in a way a local mapping 
Um, yeah. Uh, the trouble is a lot of the waste industry uh, at the moment, the resource industry is based on global exchanges of materials. And this in a way perhaps solves some problems, but also creates others when you have toxics shipped around the world and hidden or disposed of illegitimately, illegally. Yeah. So perhaps you'd like to say something on that. Yeah. Well, that last point, I think what's really, I found, interesting actually inspiring is the countries that have been accepting this material are now saying no why should we and i completely agree with them and i think what that's doing is is affecting change in in the countries that have been the exporters the main exporters so again in the uk we've had our, our ports earlier this year were clogging up with waste material that normally went east and it isn't anymore. We're just storing it in our ports until we know what to do. And so it's asking questions of our own systems and our own networks in the UK. And um, I just think what's, what's interesting is that if, uh, and this must be the situation where the large building contractors, um, infrastructure contractors are finding is that um, you know, they're getting penalized financially for throwing stuff away. They can't, export it as easily as they could before so they're actually having to look at it really look at it separate it into its constituent parts and then there, then there's this white paper been published <laughs> suggesting there's a resource exchange and they need that because they can't just do what you said which is to send it to our ports and um, and go and hide it somewhere so uh, they've got to deal with it at source now at the moment what they do nationally is for the most part if um if you've got a, a building site in the southeast of England, the waste from that building site will go to incineration in the southeast of England. So in a way, all they're saying now is instead of it going straight to incineration, we'll spend more time unpacking it, cleaning it up a bit, and then redistributing redistrib it. But it, I think from what I've heard and uh, discussed with other people, the idea of it being regional is, is makes sense because as soon as you're asking contractors to be responsible for sending stuff around the world, for, uh, it's going to cost more. So it just makes sense that they distribute it in the region that they would have normally done when they were sending it to landfill and incineration. Oh, I can't hear you. Um, we've got another um, uh, yep. 10 minutes or so. Um, and uh, I think the, the first question that Prova Tavri raised um, to me is an interesting one because uh, I'll, I'll read it out for facilitating reuse time and space are one of the major barriers for yeah. the construction industry which despite sustainability managers team teams willingness it becomes challenging for them to convince the operations team this is despite the financial benefits of reuse will the reuse directory enable resolving this issue uh, I, I would actually intervene here and say please <laughs> we, we we might actually need to change some of the the jobs uh in the hierarchy of uh especially these large projects where uh, you, you end up with everyone jumping to the tune of somebody's software package um you know, <laughs> which might actually be favoring uh, waste to get things done more quickly i mean I was, i'm wondering whether you have a um uh, a comment on this because speed can in a way you, you mentioned rotor and how they painstakingly take buildings to pieces yeah one of the, one of the great challenges which uh, this question raises is that of um the devotion to uh speed you know to the way yeah. that um you know we're we're in a sense prioritizing uh the, the uh, time and money rather than materials and this again brings up the economic problem, you know, of yeah. how how uh, the more efficient we become, the the lower the costs and often okay. the lower the prices. So, I mean, okay. you've hit on the the real big issue actually. In in addition to lack of legislation to support it, um, is um, is time. And and uh, I think what the trick Rota and one or two others have done is to point out the financial benefit, which is greater than the uh, time, you know, the t time increase on the project. I have to say also for various reasons, um, sites often take quite, a, the construction, large construction sites often for various reasons take quite a long time to start up. So 
um, uh, if you can deal with the deconstruction in the uh, sometimes there is the time for it, but time is the big deal. However, um, I happen to be lucky enough to be immersed in this world, so I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with people who are in, for whatever reason, in the situation to be pathfinders in these, this industry. And um, in the summer, I was in Brussels in, the, in Europe, and I was um, uh, speaking to someone who, came, who worked for the largest social housing company in, um, in the Netherlands, which had something like 40,000 you know, units, a, a really huge company dealing with social housing. And um, they've been working with IBM, and he hasn't published the research yet, but they were saying that they, were, they were, uh, had got evidence that they were going to make significant savings if they use secondhand components in their new housing building. And they, he, he pulled out an example of a, a fire door closer. Um, and this is a typical bit of gear that you'll have on the top of a door to make sure it closes uh, back uh, without you having to do it. It's a self-closer. And he said that they make, that on average, they've looked um, at uh, studies and they, they can prove that they can make a 38% saving on that component if they spend the time deconstructing it from a site that's been de demolished or stripped out and refurbished, uh, accounting for the ones that are broken that they have to throw away, um, but allowing for the ones that they have to clean up, oil up. Anyway, bottom line is that time that they spend on reusing that component, which is just a fire door closer, saves them 30%, 38% of uh, the cost of a new one. So that's the route they're going down. And um, I can't wait for the report to be published because it's all the stuff of, you know, and components that make dwellings that they're talking about. So basically what he was saying is it makes a lot of sense to them. And these are big, this is a big development company at the end of the day to be considering reuse instead of throwing away. So that, I'm really heartened by that. And it's an emerging, you know, it's an emerging um, idea. It's an emerging um, economy. And, um, uh, but there's, you know, I, I just like uh, promoting the, uh, the good work that's out there, really. So I know that there's a lot of people who, they, they make more money as designers if they, uh, you know, again, back to Rota, just because it's a good example. Uh, they they uh, were approached by Levi's in, in Brussels to... Um, uh, design the new interior for this massive HQ building in Brussels for Levi's and they did do that and they also what they did is they stripped out the old material um, interior very carefully redesigned a new one and use the old material to furnish the new interior so they actually made money because they designed the thing they were paid for stripping out uh, the building but they reused the old material to make the new interior so they got paid three times so, you know, they, they actually make quite good money doing it this way. Levi's have got their new interior, but it's got a really interesting story behind it. It's actually the old interior redistributed, yeah. Yeah. you know? There's, so um, I, there's a very good example in Adelaide of um, this massive roof belonging to an yeah. old Mitsubishi factory, which was yeah. retained for uh, this new um, innovation center, the Tonsley Innovation Center. But... I just wanted to get on to uh, another question which we haven't uh, answered, oh, yeah. um, which is an interesting one, because it brings up this issue of transparency, like how much are the consumers allowed to know? Um, you know, what questions, she asks, and say, uh, might consumers, uh, house purchasers ask that might promote an expectation of sustainable construction from uh, contractors? I, I mean, that one thing, one, there's two things uh, I'd ask immediately. If I was buying an, a new property, um, I would want to know in terms of its energy rating, what, what's the uh, so, uh, energy source and what's, it, what's its uh, energy consumption and carbon footprint prediction. So you, you want to talk about that, understand that. And, um, and then I'd want to, I'd be interested in uh, understanding the uh, uh, level of toxin materials that have gone into the construction of this building. So it's, I'm talking about the plastics and the formaldehyde glues and the nasty timber treatments that go into the everyday construction. The reason that's interesting is because if it is designed as a well-sealed, highly insulated environment, those toxic materials, those everyday materials we use, um, will make the air quality bad. And so you, you don't want to be suffering from sick building syndrome and what have you. Air quality is a big, big deal. Um, the other thing, though, which would which not many people would be 
to be able to answer as an affirmative is is this building designed as a material store for the future in other words can it be deconstructed one day and create other buildings and most times at the moment people are going to say no um, but the idea of uh, you know what, what's it made of and what's its energy rate would be the two two um, questions I'm going to be asking um, could we ever get to the point where um, we are forced to uh, um, put labels on buildings on new buildings uh, now we have um, uh, we have a star rating system here yeah Lee but uh, very few consumers know that it's actually 10 stars. They think they've done really well when they have five. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've even seen tower blocks with three boldly mm. on, as mm. though this is sort of some amazing, uh, you know, event. So, um, yeah, so certainly uh, standards are an interesting one. This brings us to our last question. How do you address the standards associated with building materials when we plan for reusing, especially regulations like REACH, et cetera. So, um, um, yeah, I, th I think what's interesting is when you look at the sort of top 10 waste streams off construction sites, if you're dealing with waste and, and surplus material, it's rather dull, predictable stuff, which is good. It's plasterboard, it's uh, topsoil, it's, um, uh, it's crushed its aggregates and things like that and so actually a lot of it is not that complex therefore um, secondhand aggregates or secondhand um, uh, bits of plasterboard I mean you know what's what's populating our incinerators and landfill sites are actually you know unused sheets of plasterboard it's a lot of its surplus materials so a lot of that is quite easy to reuse at the end of the day. So this is the sort of low lying fruit of that stuff, which constitutes about a third of all the construction waste. Um, and then you've got the sort of rubble and stuff, which in, in an ideal world you wouldn't have because you wouldn't be demolishing uh, concrete frame buildings. You'd be keeping the frame and recladding. So I think a lot of it is quite straightforward. The really technical stuff. I mean, when we did the waste house, we could only make it 90% secondhand material because you can't at the moment use secondhand wiring for electrics you can't use secondhand pipes for plumbing and waste so and you know it's so those are things that are, are different challenges but a lot of stuff from construction waste is pretty straightforward mm. and um, you know there's a that there's a great big building that's uh, been used for the last couple of years in brussels you know an, an eu um, headquarters building and it's, it's got this facade, massive facade made up of, you know, uh, I don't know, 400 secondhand timber windows. And, it, and you know, that was relatively easy for them to find. So this is low, low um, performing stuff. It's, it's just a sort of rain screen facade. And then they've got the high tech um, precision stuff be behind. So I think you just, if you really understand what's coming off construction sites, um, it's not that technical. Um, I'm not sure um, we've got, I'm not sure if we've got much more time. Um, Sveta, have we overrun or uh, can we ask? In, you know? We are just about time, but if you feel like asking another question, I think we can extend for another five minutes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Duncan, um, I, I, um, I wanted to ask you about the future and uh, because we're, we're, we're literally drowning in waste. Yeah. Uh, Personally, I'd like to see all waste managers become resource managers, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, the the uh, you know the more positive thoughts about what you'd like to see in the construction industry. You've sort of you you've given us some of them, but I just wonder if you wanted to wrap up the final. Okay, moment. well, I would feel like I'd shortchange my colleague from Sydney. Kat Fletcher, if I didn't mention she was the UK's only resource manager and, she, and she's Brighton and Hove City's resource manager and she everywhere else they're called a waste manager and so she's a resource manager. Um, but looking forward, uh, I mean what the, I just, you know, this is, is going to hit, hit, hit Australia pretty hard, but I actually think we don't need to mine anymore. Stop mm. mining. See what happens if you closed mines for five years and you just then mine the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene obviously is the human made layer of stuff that's wrapped, wrapped planet Earth. If we reuse 
the stuff that's lying around instead of finding source material for raw new material for a bit just do it for five years see what happens and you'll just have to look at stuff that you don't normally look at just as a human race you know or i've got to say a lot of the plant people on planet earth do that all the time but in places where they're building and rebuilding and rebuilding all the time they're not looking down or looking up they're just getting the new stuff arriving so for uh, you know a very near future would be to close mines stop sending people down horrible holes to get stuff uh, you know we're in a world now where plenty of people are saying there's more copper above ground than below ground it's easier to get you get more gold out of a ton of iphones than you do out of uh, a ton of the best gold ore from south africa so just uh, yeah mind the anthropocene that's what we've got to do for the next decade or so i say thank you thank you so much duncan for your uh, your thoughts uh, i'm sure the audience found it very stimulating and uh, thank you, Sveta, as well. <laughs> so is, is that it? Yeah, I think time. Thank you up. very much. It's been brilliant. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, you Robert. And thank you, Sveta. Thank you so much, Duncan. Uh, especially your final thought was absolutely great. So uh, thanks a lot for that. And uh, thank you, Robert, for another panel, which was completely different from the others that you did for us. And uh, we will, uh, uh, Robert already has thoughts for the fourth panel with us, which, will, which we hope to have some time in November. So please uh, sign up for our newsletter, go to our website and sign up and you will get the update about that. Thanks everyone, bye-bye. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, thanks. Cheerio, Duncan. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>